In a previous life, I was a particle physicist at uh, Lancaster University. Um, and I worked on B quark physics in the Aleph detector, which is this, this thing here. Uh, and that was in the tunnel where the Large Hadron Collider now is. And in that work, I ended up on a whole load of papers uh, with about 250 other people on things like uh, neutrino species. Um, and then you know, the 90s hit and my PhD funding ran out as these things do. And physics was on the same corridor as the geography department. And the geography department had this Northwest Regional Research Lab, which was uh, full of these computers doing GIS. And that was just down the corridor from where we worked. And this was funded by the UK Research Councils. And I knew the geographers because they were just down the corridor. And we used to play cricket with the geographers. So we, we had these physics versus geography cricket matches. So using the time-honored English method of giving jobs to your cricketing pals, I found myself becoming a researcher in GIS. And that meant I went almost overnight from looking at the smallest, most weakly interacting particles in the universe to looking at perhaps the most impactful events in a human life. This is a map of 1980s leukemia cases in Humberside. Each of those dots is a leukemia case, or rather the triangle, each of those triangles is a leukemia case. Whereas previously every dot was a neutrino interacting with a detector underground in Switzerland somewhere. And I had a bit of an epiphany at that and I never looked back and I never got my PhD. The research project that employed me on this was driven by concerns that came up in the 80s about apparent cancer clusters caused by things like power cables or nuclear sites. And there were reports and papers all about those that came out in the 80s and there was a reaction to that. And the project had two primary investigators who are now great friends, Tony Gatchell, a geographer who had all the GIS expertise, and Peter Diggle, who was a spatial, spatial statistician who had all the statistics expertise. And these two got together and uh, got this project going. Now, in the 1990s, <sighs> GIS was very different. The leading GIS were mostly command line driven and they were great for doing things like maintaining your spatial data in a nice database and doing the sort of standard spatial operations like buffering and intersecting. And um, well, they could make lovely wall, wall art cartographic charts, but they were lacking in statistical analysis. You could probably do simple tabulations using your database component, but you couldn't do anything too sophisticated. So our plan was to put some sophisticated spatial statistics functions into GIS. Now, spatial statistics, I kind of define it as the analysis and modeling of random processes where location matters. And note that it doesn't have to be geospatial. A lot of spatial statistics is done with patterns on microscope slides, for example. And it doesn't have to be two dimensional. It can be one dimensional data where the position on that one dimension matters or it can be three-dimensional data um, or even more dimensions uh, if you've got it. The branch of spatial statistics that we were most interested in because of the diseases was uh, point pattern analysis. Now this is where the locations themselves are generated by some interesting process. So for example, the locations of trees in a natural forest, why are the trees there and not there? Or perhaps the positions of cells uh, in a tissue sample are a real big question about patterns of disease. Why are these people here getting a disease and these people not? Now statistics in the 90s, you were kind of in one of two camps. You were either using and abusing the sort of main statistics package, most of these still survive today, um, or you were writing your own programs, which meant writing lots of Fortran and to a certain extent things like C, APL and LISP. Uh, and there was increasing use of a thing called S and the new S environment for statistical data analysis and graphics. Um, and you were kind of in one of these two camps. You were either doing the standard stuff in new uh, settings or you were writing your own code and developing your own your new methodologies. And we were looking at how to bring the statistics into the GIS. And there was a lot of discussion about the right way to integrate the functionality between your GIS and your Fortran code. Did you have 
a loose coupling with separate processes via what we now call an API? Or did you integrate your code tightly into the GIS so it appeared as native GIS functions? And I was never convinced this was a useful discussion about this. It went on for some years about this, uh, papers in the conferences and whatnot. And we ended up taking this diagram and basically flipping it inside out so that we, we added GIS and spatial statistics to the statistics package, which was S plus. This was a proprietary implementation of a non-open source language. And we added our code into that and gave it some simple GIS functions. And this became a paper in 1993, uh, which documented Splanks, which stood for spatial point pattern analysis code in S plus, but also has Lancaster hidden in it. And this paper was 10 pages of text and examples. And after that came 19 pages purely of the function documentation. The, most of the paper in the journal was the function documentation, the manual pages for the, for the code that we'd written. Um, this, isn't, this wasn't really uncommon at the time. The, the very next article in that volume of the journal was this one called C programs for controlling pore and bulk volume compressibility experiments. And this was actually three pages of explanatory text and a, a nice flow chart. And what then followed was 13 pages of C code. Okay. And this is when journals were not electronic. At the time, most people saw this on paper. And if they wanted to use this code, they had to type it in. Now, the, uh, the author very you know, nicely gave his address. Um, you could probably you know, write to him to get his email because no one seemed to give their emails out in these journals. Um, there's no phone number as well, so you, you couldn't phone him. I mean, you could go and knock on his front door. And uh, I thought, well, I wonder, I wonder. Just the other day, I thought, I wonder what this, this place looks like, 149 11th Street, Del Mar, California. So I, I, I went to Google Street View and look at that. Isn't that amazing? That's, you know, you could have knocked on that door and said, can I have your C code, please? And then you could have gone for a dip in the Pacific. A wonderful, wonderful spot. Nice place. Anyway, there's some other differences between this and modern publications. There's no mention in this of licensing. There's no sample data. There's no unit tests. There's no example runs. And it also seems that the journal has got the copyright on the code as well. And again, this was common back in the 90s. This was how things were done. Um, what we did with Splanks is we at least made it, uh, we offered it to, out to distribute it on floppy disk for a small fee of 60 pounds. I don't know what happened to the cash. I think it's resting in someone's account. Um, and in case you've never seen one for a while, this is, a, this is what a floppy disk looks like. Um, now I, I couldn't find a floppy disk I wanted, an image of a floppy disk on Unsplash or anywhere I can get free images. So I looked in my desk drawer yesterday as I was writing this slide and ah, I found a box. I found a box of, box of floppy drives, floppy disks, right? And I thought, which one, which one shall I use? And I picked this one because I thought, okay, I'll, I'll show a Microsoft DOS disk from 1990s. And when I looked at it closely, I noticed it actually had Splanks penciled in on it. This was an old Splanks disk from about then. And uh, I haven't got a floppy drive to actually tell whether this has actually got a copy of Splanks on it at the moment, but it's really weird this happened yesterday. Um, I'll point out that if you paid 60 quid for a disk, we didn't just recycle Microsoft disks. You did get a brand new disk back in 1993 with Splanks on it. This distribution really only went on for a couple of years um, because other delivery mechanisms became available. Once email addresses were more ubiquitous, people could be emailed <coughs> data and programs in encoded formats, or they could connect using FTP. Uh, and then eventually the shiny new world of the World Wide Web came in and everyone was using that to exchange everything. So what did we have for spatial epidemiology back then for disease analysis? 
there were the existing well-known statistical methods which were based on things like likelihood and Monte Carlo randomness. There were new statistical methods coming in with things like Bayesian techniques and Markov chain Monte Carlo which meant you could analyze very different problems. And there were also a whole swathe of what I think of as geographical methods, things like the local indicators of, of spatial autocorrelation, the Moran psi coefficient and, and other characters like that. And there was also the geographical analysis machine things that were coming in from uh, Stan Openshaw in the team in Leeds. And uh, these were looked at you know, with, with some interest as techniques for looking at disease clusters. Openshaw's geographical analysis machine got a lot of um, interest back then, uh, partly because it was very graphical and you could watch it draw these circles of where it thought the clusters were and geographers got very excited by this, statisticians less so because it was testing so many thousands of hypotheses. And looking at it now from an open source point of view, I, I thought let's go and see if I can find the Openshaw GAM code. But I discovered that it was never distributed because it was not easily run and its dependency on a supercomputer severely restricted its usefulness. Now I did a, I did a computation yesterday that um, if Openshaw's GAM took a month to run on a supercomputer back then, it would run in a maybe an hour or so on a modern CPU like you've got on your desk in front of you now. And if you converted the code to run on the CPU, you could, you could run it in the blink of an eye, I think. So I don't think supercomputer reliance today is an excuse for not distributing your code. So in summary, in the 90s to the sort of turn of the millennium, epidemiological analysis was constrained because the data was small and rare and hard to get. Software was specialist and in many cases very slow to do anything useful. And the methods that we had were either sort of standard and not quite appropriate, or they were developing and not really uh, finely tuned to what we were, we were trying to do. That's where we were round about the 90s and the turn of the millennium. And we all remember what happened then. Uh, the millennium bug hit and everything crashed. No. Okay, I'll step us through now. I'm going to whiz through 20 years of history. Okay, and this, this is a bit like... Um, five minutes to go, Barry five minutes I had 20 minutes on my clock okay I've had 10 okay anyway I'm going to whiz through all these years of history with a couple of uh, little points and then we get to 2020 okay if you want an idea of the applications of spatial statistics in health today you can go to our group web page and look at the projects we have on and none of this could be achieved without the advances in open data open software and communications that we now have. For open data, we now have easy access to census data and census derived data. We can get NHS health data, which for disease is mostly rates or counts in small areas rather than point locations because of anonymity. We also have big data and the tools to deal with it. We have APIs for accessing the latest versions of the data we want when we need it. And there's also increasingly huge amounts of crowdsourced geographic information. We have the hardware to deal with all this now, but we don't have to own it. We can use cloud computing to just rent the computers that we need. And we can even rent uh, databases as software as a service uh, and take our data to that and serve it to our applications. There's a growing uh, increase in the understanding that research software is important and an understanding that publicly funded software should be open licensed for the public good. Uh, there's a recognition that science has to be reproducible to be science and that software is part of that reproducibility pipeline and that means that closed source software cannot be part of science. This is very much driven by the Software Sustainability Institute in this country. That idea that science has to be open source worries me with things like Google Earth Engine. A lot of scientists using this now, uh, they're unconcerned that tomorrow Google could pull this and consign this to their, their graveyard. If you look at killedbygoogle.com, they have a very sad graveyard of all the projects that Google have killed, including a lot of geospatial projects like MapMaker and Fluid Trends and Fusion Tables, which stored a lot of spatial data at the time. So beware of what Google may give and take away. So let's talk about coronavirus. We have to. We have to. The government has 
their emergency response organized by SAGE at the top level, which fan out into the subgroups, including SPI-M, which is the group tasked with modeling. Now I know people on SPI-M, we have people on SPI-M in our group, and they have access to the line listing of COVID-19 cases, the individual case data, so that's, that can't be made public for anonymity reasons. But they've had a big fuss about transparency with the modeling software they've been using, in particular Neil Ferguson's group at Imperial, um, who the newspapers, the press discovered that software has bugs and they piled in uh, with comments like it was some um, bugs in software of, of meant that we've had to close down the country. Well, that's ridiculous. We, we had to do this anyway. Um, and the, what's the significance of the bugs in software? Well, we didn't really know because the code was unpublished. Now, eventually a version of the code was made available and it was ripped to shreds by people who didn't really understand what research was all about and what research computing had to deal with. Um, Neil has tried to defend this uh, and I'm not sure any of the reasons that were kind of purported for him not publishing the software were really valid. I think it was just not published because there was no need to publish it. Um, no one was actually using it and um, I, I think it was a piece of academic code. It, it had the potential to affect policy but not until this pandemic did it actually do that and then it became important that this code could be seen to be correct because of the influence it had on so many lives. Several trillion pounds if you believe some commentators. Now the government was a bit better with its openness for the data eventually. The first sort of um, dashboards for COVID-19 data had no link to the data and if you wanted to get the data, the case counts and the death counts, you had to build a scraper to get the data from the tables and the maps and the website requests and you could you do that and some people did that, several people did that independently and these things were open sourced and they were used and people were building dashboards. Then the government kind of um, produced a version 2 which um, actually had a link that you could click which would then construct the data and then download it but that again couldn't be scripted very easily that was all done inside the JavaScript and eventually the third version gave you a static link that you could click and get the uh, get a CSV of cases and that enables people to build all these dashboards and there are a heck of a lot of dashboards out there doing things like this and um, we are very interested in modeling predicting the data and looking at areas of the country that are sort of um, perhaps should be further locked down or less locked down and to that extent the thing I've been working on recently has been a map of looking at the probability that the reproduction rate, the, the whether the epidemic is increasing or decreasing, the probability whether that rate is over or under one. And I've tried to do this in conjunction with our, the Lancaster SPI-M committee members in a fully open and reproducible way. And the way I've done that is that all the code is in a GitLab repository and I've leveraged the sort of continuous integration process which is often used by developers in order to run tests on their code every time you make a change to the code, use that to run an analysis process. So the continuous integration process which runs off the uh, GitLab runner pulls the latest data from the UK website, fits the model of the reproduction rate, and then writes a CSV and a GeoJSON file for the data so we can plot maps and charts. And this is pushed to a GitLab page repository. So you've then got a live updated um, web page driven by an automatic process that's also open source from a repository where all the software and methods are open source and this is this is a fully almost fully reproducible there are one or two things in there that are, can't really be done and the sort of rush and panic of all these dashboards and methods uh, brings me back to something that Professor Diggle said very early in the epidemic which was that the best time to work on pandemic modeling is when there isn't a pandemic on and I think he he added but nobody wants to do that um, well, I mean, I, I want to do that. I want to be doing this in 2021 when there isn't a pandemic on. Um, and I hope to see you all perhaps in person when there isn't a pandemic next year. Um, 
so everyone i want everyone to stay safe and you know flatten the curve i want to see i want to see all blue in this chart in this uh, in this map this is where r is definitely under one and this was a few days ago this is actually live and real um that's what i want to see i want to see a nice blue map and i want to see everyone back at uh, phosphor g uk 2021 somewhere next year thank you very much Wonderful. Thank you very much, Barry. Uh, that was a great presentation and it, it was great to see how you've uh, kind of utilised some of the, the Travis CI stuff for analysis rather than code testing as well. I've not seen that before, so that, that's a really fascinating implementation. If you do have any questions for Barry, please do continue to send them through the, the chat uh, and I'll, I'll relay them. Um, uh, we, I've got one, a kind of quite a general one. You mentioned in passing about the the kind of um, pressure, well not pressures, uh, issues of having open source software and many academics also using things like Google Earth Engine, and the risk that Google could pull Google Earth Engine. That's that's, 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 a, that's a great comment. Um, what would you say to someone who said that the reason people use Google Earth Engine is because it's so easy to use, and Google have kind of transformed the ease of use of geospatial stuff, then they might say that the open source stuff is quite hard to use, whereas Google Earth Engine is much easier. I think if you're an academic doing science, you're, I know it's hard to, to take the, the road less traveled, um, but the more people that use the open source solutions, the more people are there to develop and improve those solutions and it's a mutual win. I can't improve Google Earth Engine. Um, I can I can improve QGIS, I can improve GrassGIS if I want to, if I if I was more of a C programmer. And and I think the the idea that science is should be open and reproducible and public is is absolutely fundamental and People, people don't even realize perhaps that using proprietary software is, in my opinion, taking them out of the realm of science because we've been doing it for so long. We were doing it in 1993 and many people are still doing it now. If, if we'd taken this path more strongly 20 years ago, we'd be in a different place now. Maybe Google Earth Engine or something like it would be an open source piece of infrastructure sitting on top of... Uh, uh, an abstract cloud system that wasn't tied to Google or, or anyone else. But I can dream. I can, I'm an academic. I have that freedom. Uh, great. And it's certainly definitely easier uh, to, to, to use the, the, the systems we have now than it was 20 years ago, I would say, from what I've seen. Uh, we've got some more questions. Um, so uh, from Andy Murdoch, what do you think can be done to harmonize data better globally? COVID-19 has shown the difficulties uh, and also the politics in what is released. Yeah, I, I think it's hard enough to harmonize data within uh, administrative units. Um, just the previous talk that I went to about the Romanian dashboard, the, the Romanian government apparently stopped publishing the data at, at a small level and then went back to it and how you would compare data against the way the UK has published its data or the way that the US. Um, the definition of a case has changed in the UK. Um, I, I think you need local knowledge, so you need local people. I, I'm not sure. Yeah. It's a big effort to do this globally. And um, I think Johns Hopkins have done a lot of work on this. There's a, the Johns Hopkins dashboard has, has brought together a lot of global data. And I think that's um, Maybe there are some lessons that can be learned from that. Great, thank you. Uh, another question from Mills Denchek. Apologies about the pronunciation. Uh, Barry mentioned earlier that um, spatial modelling doesn't need to mean geospatial. Uh, we'd love to know uh, what's been some notable or interesting creative uses you've seen for this. So you talked about uh, Microsoft, uh, no, sorry, not Microsoft, microscope samples. So it'd be great to hear a bit more about that. Yeah, um, well, a very recent one that I've been working on with a, a colleague was modeling kidney, uh, the, pat the, the structure of kidneys, because the, the different types of cell in, in the kidney, the human kidney, and the way the blood and the, um, the, 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 
plasma in the blood flows through a kidney and, and the way that the sort of extracted eventually urine or whatever the, the product of the kidney cells is and we've we've been looking at how the 3d structure of the cells and how all the cells kind of relate to each other with the idea of building a 3d model a sort of stochastic 3d model of how a kidney a small section of kidney works in, in three dimensions that's that's um, very new but the one of the main um, the, the sort of classic examples of spatial statistics in the textbooks is looking at the patterns of cells in a rabbit's eye and trying to figure out whether the two different cells um, have developed independently or whether they sort of develop in pairs and that kind of brings back to how the retina uh, develops in the developing animal um, and, and back then actually data like that was more common because it was much easier to get consent from a, uh, a dead rabbit than it was from the people in the, the leukemia study in Humberside that I kind of started this talk off of. 